So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to PSS Ryan Bernson's uh, leadership webinar series. Uh, this is an event we have uh, biannually uh, with different industry leaders across uh, industries uh, that are critical to uh, economic growth. Uh, today, we our focus is, as you can see, with uh, preeminent leaders uh, and senior executives from the Indian pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I will introduce them shortly. But before that, uh, a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, this is a, a recorded webinar session uh, with the consent given by our guest today. Uh, any questions that uh, one may have uh, can be addressed uh, after a 60 minute uh, back and forth. We have on three topics uh, of discussion for the webinar. So the first 60 minutes will be uh, discussion with our keynote speakers on a variety of topics. And then we'll open it up to the floor for the last 45 minutes of the session for Q&A. Um, any guests uh, who have questions related to the discussion or outside of the discussion, but related to the topics, uh, please uh, do type type them in in the chat, uh, in the chat facility that's available. Um, and uh, we will try our best to get to each and every question. Uh, thank you also to all the guests and attendees of the event today. Uh, we hope you find uh, some of the uh, information delivered and insights provided by our guests be very useful um, as you'll go about your own roles or if you're entrepreneurs in pharmaceutical in the pharmaceutical space, uh, you, you will find this information very useful going forward. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Mr. Sudarshan Jain. Uh, Sudarshan is the Secretary General of the Indian Pharmaceutical Alliance. Uh, he is also involved in uh, you know, many other uh, ventures. He is a senior advisor with APAX Partners currently as well. Uh, so Darshan has served in several leadership roles over the last 40 years of his uh, esteemed career in the healthcare and pharmaceutical space, uh, including with uh, the likes of uh, Lupin, uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Piramal, uh, Abbott Healthcare. And of course, he was, uh, he was a CEO or managing director in, uh, many of these uh, organizations. Uh, he is also a visiting faculty member at uh, IIM Ahmedabad and has contributed in a very big way to shaping the healthcare policy and improving access to healthcare in India. You will see him on many news channels uh, promoting the interests of the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare industry in the country. Uh, Sudarshan is also an alumnus of St. Stephen's College, Delhi and um, IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Amitava Saha. Uh, Amitava is uh, currently the President Human Resources with uh, Biocon Pharmaceuticals Limited, Asia's leading uh, biopharma company. Uh, he has uh, spent a large part of his career in organizations like uh, Infosys, Accenture, uh, Mashrek Bank, and First Source Solutions. So a lot of it outside the pharmaceutical industry and will bring a different perspective uh, to, I'm sure, to this uh, discussion as well uh, from a non pharma perspective, given his prior experience. Uh, he's managed global workforces across Asia, the United States, and Europe in various international assignments as well. Uh, Mr. Saas started his professional career in sales and marketing uh, and then uh, moved on to uh, an HR role, his first role with Infosys uh, in uh, various uh, talent acquisition. Uh, and uh, human resource management responsibilities. Uh, he was also responsible for setting up the recruitment practice at uh, Accenture and uh, Accenture BPO, and as well as with uh, Mashrek Bank uh, in Dubai. Uh, prior to joining Biocon in 2013, uh, Amita was heading the talent acquisition and human resource function Asia Pacific for Perso Solutions. Uh, Amita is a BE, uh, an engineering, electrical engineering graduate from uh, Delhi College of Engineering and uh, an MBA from uh, IIM Calcutta. And uh, our final speaker for today, Mr. Yashwan Mahadik. Um, he is the president of uh, the, uh, Global Human Resources with uh, Lupin Pharmaceuticals. Um, Yashwan's experience is extremely diverse and spans a wide range of sectors and geographies. Uh, prior to joining Lupin, uh, Rash uh, Yashwan has worked with Organizations like Philips, uh, JNJ, AstraZeneca, uh, Colgate Palmolive. Uh, he has also been recognized as one of the top 50 uh, HR thought leaders um, in the country uh, and in India 
by the Economic Times, uh, the World HRD Congress, and uh, the Society of uh, Human Resource Management Professionals. So with that, uh, again, gentlemen, welcome and thank you for uh, joining us uh, on this uh, discussion. Um, let's start first with uh, you know what we uh, what we have on our agenda, which is uh, skill shortages and talent in the pharma industry across uh, across functions. That would include strategy, uh, marketing, sales, manufacturing, quality control, R and D, regulatory, and I'm sure I'm missing some. But we will get to that. So the first question is, uh, what, where, maybe from a personal perspective, to each of you gentlemen, uh, where do you see uh, major, possibly skill shortages in terms of talent, as well as opportunities uh, for pharmaceutical companies today, uh, when it comes to developing a, a short to medium term uh, talent strategy? I'll keep the question general, and I'll get more specific as we go on. So. I'll open the floor up to the speakers. Uh, anyone who wants to take it first, please go ahead. Okay, so so let me let me start, uh, uh, Mr. Jain, if that is okay with you. Yeah. Yeah, perfect, uh, perfect. Yes. So uh, you see, uh, Andre. I mean, this is our belief in the pharma industry, and uh, this is my personal opinion and view, which can be then vetted by. Uh, Amitava and uh, Mr. Jain, both. There is a oh. stated talent shortage in the pharma industry, and there's a latent talent shortage in the pharma industry, as we say today. And uh, in indeed, there is a shortage of talent. Okay, and it, it's happening on two counts. One is, you see, if you look at the the growth of the pharmaceutical industry in India, it's been huge. It's been among us. Uh, if you see the growth of healthcare sector itself, where pharma is a large part of it, it's been huge, okay? Uh, there are so many pharma companies which are in the $100 million club and a billion dollar club, which weren't even there 10, 15 years ago, okay? So, so that's sure. the good news. That's the good news, and that's the India story, which is unfolding. But what is happening is, uh, instead of fresh and new talent coming in, a lot of talent is rotating, you know, within those companies. Now, Amitabh will also tell you, we are also in that space, they are in that space, especially biopharma, okay? Now, these are skills which cannot be built overnight, okay? And these are skills which take a long time to build, but when you are making vaccines or when you are the biopharma or biosimilars, whatever, you know, whichever way you want to call it, the companies need those skills, okay? And they are uh, not just in manufacturing or in sales, you know, it's mostly in technical fields such as manufacturing, regulatory, you know, uh, medical information, medical affairs of all these, which are, so what happens is that the same talent is rotating and then everyone at some point of time feels that talent shortage. Um, the, the second thing which is really impacting in my opinion, and then I'll hand it over to others is, so what is happening is, if you look at it, and that's where the industries are merging, Andre, even in my notes that I had sent you earlier, the industrial oh. skills cross industry are merging because of digitization, okay? <laughs> so if you have done regulatory affairs of a gaming company, today those skills are absolutely relevant to uh, uh, a pharma company which is going in the digital services because what you need is knowledge of digitization and the regulatory frameworks how they work okay so so these are the latent uh, talent shortages if i may call and say so where many a times uh, companies don't even know how to properly define the jd and you want to hire for that okay so, so that, in my opinion, uh, is what is my two cents worth. Now, I request Amitabh and Mr. Jain to talk about it also. So, Mr. So Jain, uh, with your permission, can I go next? Yeah, sure, sure, Amitabh. <laughs> okay, so I'll just build on what Yash was saying. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very correct and very true that uh, the skill shortage is quite acute and it's becoming worse. Uh, but 
the way I look at it, it's not just for pharma. Uh, it's for several industries because India as a country is going through a, a very high growth curve. And when that happens, uh, the talent pool doesn't uh, keep up with it because it takes time for the talent pool to get experience because a lot of learning is on the job. You can't teach them, like I said, in schools or colleges or overnight over any other platform. Now, if you look at pharma, pharma is a very knowledge intensive industry. And here, your education is just the platform to launch you. After that, everything comes from experience. And as Yash was saying, the more we are diversifying our products and portfolios, each company, uh, we are trying to uh, get people who have relevant experience. In many such cases, the experience probably is outside of India. And it is not easy to get that talent pool in at short notice or at a constant basis. So it's always a tug of war between your growth as a company, training your internal pool, losing some of your best guys to someone else in the industry, and then trying to attract people to you know, fill up that void. So whether you talk of regulatory, whether you talk of quality, whether you talk of manufacturing, everywhere the talent shortage is at a certain niche profile or at senior leadership level, right? And it is being felt, in my opinion, across the industry. So I'll take a pause here, uh, Mr. Jant, please. So first is, uh, thank you very much uh, to PSS, uh, Andre, and Mario is here. Uh, for inviting me for this discussion. Uh, thanks also to be part of this discussion with Yash and Amitava. Uh, I have interacted with Yash and seen him working on the talent. And also I can see a lot of friends joining this discussion. Uh, I bring a very, I have been a business head for the years and I now work in private equity policy shaping. So I will first start with a comment that this is going to be the decade of healthcare for India. And maybe over a period of time, I will say why it is the decade of healthcare. Uh, two sectors which will make difference to this country. One is IT, but IT has moved hell of a lot in talent game. And second is form. So that is one of the important thing. And the name of the game for the companies which are going to make difference is talent, talent, talent. Because talent is going to be the differentiating edge and what I think is, I keep on talking in all the forums with the CEOs, that the key role will be HR. What IT did for 2000, 2000K, HR will do for 2020 and going forward. So the companies which will win the, win the game is HR-focused companies, which realize the value of talent. And Yash has been part of those companies. JNJ, I worked, Lupin, I worked in the earlier days. I've been part of Abbott over the years where talent and talent and talent is the critical factor. And it is not only HR agenda, it is the top management agenda, right? So that is point number one. Point number two is war for talent. So war, when I say, how do you win the talent? How do you assimilate the talent? And how do you make the talent result oriented? Giving the fact that you, you have to win the war of talent. So war for talent for me is getting the best talent, winning the best talent, assimilating that talent in the organization because you can get the talent, but most of the times you can't assimilate that talent and make that talent result oriented. It is not talking. It is walking the talk, which will make the difference. Point number two. Point number three is given the fact that India will play a vital role in healthcare. The days of talent, even what marketing was yesterday. I used to do marketing, say, three years back and recognize for building the brands. But the marketing requirement today has undergone a fundamental change. Because what we are looking for is the access of medicine in this country is only 30 to 40 percent. Communicable diseases are going up. So the skill of just working with sales force is not what is required. You need only channel approach. I am just giving one example. So the kind of talent which you need is undergoing a fundamental change. So first is talent will win the game, point number one. Point number two, healthcare is a winning area. Point number three is, what is the talent gap? Maybe we can discuss in different areas, the way it was there, what will be required for the future in the current areas, and what are the new talent requirements which will be there going forward. I will stop here and leave it to my 
good friends, yes, and Amita, and then we can move forward from here. Sure, I'll I'll just unless if people want to say something, please go ahead. I, those were all very insightful opening comments. Um, I would like to build on that unless someone wants to uh, respond to Sudarshan's uh, comments. No, no, absolutely. Please go ahead. But I would love to build on Mr. Jain's uh, because, you know, just uh, two months ago, Mr. Jain and me, we were in a room. We are both alumni of j, &J Johnson & Johnson, and it was an alumni meet. But the topic of the discussion was talent. Jain sahab, if you remember. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, what Mr. Jain spoke, he he spoke like a CEO and a business leader because that's what he has been his uh, entire career. Plus, he has been a specialist of marketing, of sales, of commercial. So he has seen it all, right? And and today he's uh, leading the entire consortium of the pharma industry. So let's let's build on it. I will, but but let's take the discussion forward because I'll give some specific okay. examples, Andre, which then even Amitabh and Mr. Jain can comment on on what is really shifting because that needs to be understood. Because, you know, in my opinion, if the fundamentals are not understood, like Mr. Jain said, McKinsey had come up with this concept of war for talent, they're thought leaders par excellence. There's no doubt about it. But also, in one of the McKinsey conferences, which I attended in Amsterdam when I was working there with Philips 10 years ago, I remember someone saying the war for talent is over and the talent has won it. So it's over. So what is it that we have to do Fundamentally, the shift that is happening in the industry, in the workplaces of Amitav mentioned, are critical and crucial to understand for the CEO and for the CHRO. If we don't get that right, trust me, we will keep discussing all of this till the cows come home and nothing will happen. Sure. Yash, on that point, you know, in your opening uh, note, you mentioned uh, circulation of talent across many of the major pharma companies, right? That was one of the points uh, that you sort of brought up and also skills merging. Uh, the skills merging part was interesting. I'll come back to that. But, you know, on the circulation of talent and then, you know, Amita talked about this. Uh, there is a learning lag, right? In pharma industry is very unique in the sense that there is a lot of learning on the job and that takes time. And so putting these two things in together, uh, uh, do we just need a lot more talent, uh, you know, from the source, so from the institutes, from the from academia coming in to the pharma industry? Uh, are we prepared for that as a, you know, at a broader level as a country to meet the domestic uh, opportunity? Um, and what about the, you know, the collaboration between academia and pharma? Right. Uh, I was going through Lupin's uh, careers website, uh, Biocons as well, as well as uh, several other companies. Right. A lot of the, the big organizations have their a plan in place in terms of how they can develop talent pipelines. And can you talk about this as well as, you know, do we have a real, real shortage and can that be addressed within the next five years? Sure, 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 Andre. So I, I'll give my take on it and then, uh, you know, others uh, can you know add to it or you know comment on it you see there is there is a serious gap between the talent that is coming out for the industry versus what the industry needs okay and it has happened because uh, of various reasons okay so so what used to happen is if you look at uh, the way our uh, economy and our industries and the jobs have evolved for the past 100 years, OK? So the first 30 years of the evolution of the industry, education system was not responsible for building skills. The industry was responsible for building its skills, OK? So when Ford Motor Company started, they are the ones who also started developing skills of a lathe machine operator, OK, et cetera, because there was nothing. The first country which took that and really made it was Germany when they came up with this apprenticeship program. OK. And then, as you see, because automotive used to be the core industry of the world at that point of time, because they realized you don't need an engineering degree to work on the shop floor. What you need is ancillary or very focused skills. And that's where the entire apprentice mm 
training and education system of Germany, which became a model for the world. Okay, they started teaching skills which were specific to what the jobs in the industry are, and they became one of the most successful economies and a quality economy, because you know as they call it as German skill and engineer engineering, as they call as the Swiss precision and service. Right, each country got known by it. You see. Oh. We did copy that as a country, but we didn't do a very good job. Our ITIs was that, you know, it was a, a straight cut and paste or a copy of the German apprentice uh, education system. And then in India, the industry took all like, you know, Mr. Jain uh, probably started his career 15 years before I started because he's my senior. And I also started about 34 years ago right now. You look at it even then. Whenever you used to talk of these companies that we worked in, they thought it is their responsibility to build skills. It became untenable, not because of the cost. It's because of the massive shift in the skill itself required to work. When the PLC operating machines came, the skills were very different than a, that of a lathe operator and all. So you see the, the work and the skills are evolving at a pace that not only academia, but even companies are not being able to keep up with it on how to do it. So it's a real problem. I must compliment the government and I must say this. There is no government in the world. I have lived and worked in the United States, you know, in the recent 15, 20 years. I have lived and worked in Japan. I have lived and worked in Amsterdam, in UK. OK, at least these four economies. I'm seeing their governments are also struggling with this and they've done little. But our entire National Skill Development Council, the programs and how even IPS tied and Mr. Jain can throw some light. It's beautiful. OK, and now the academia, the industry and third party alliances, because education is no more a domain of uh, academia or industry. A YouTube teacher has become a huge expert in skill building. OK, uh, 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 AR, VR, uh, 3D, Metaverse, Module, Content Developer has become a huge knowledge and skill builder. It's no more academia, so we should not talk about the gap between. We just need to identify and make it happen. And some industry associations are doing it. Some industries are doing it very well. I take pride. I work in pharma and um, IPA and, and I leave that to Mr. Jain how it is being done. Uh, uh, we all reckon we are not the uh, benchmark right now, but a lot of effort and thinking gone into it. So those are my two cents worth. I would now defer it to my colleagues to comment and take the discussion further. I'll just uh, build a little bit on what Yash was saying before uh, handing it. Then I think uh, very aptly what Yash said. Amitav, uh, Amitav can't hear you. Can you be louder, please? You know. Yeah. I Perfect. Yes, a little better. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, this is much better. So, yeah. So, uh, what I was trying to say is that, like Yash rightly said, it's no longer a problem of academia and industry. Uh, academia has started putting in a lot of courses in collaboration with the industry today, and that is preparing people earlier than later. So that's number one. Number two, a lot of companies are starting their finishing schools. You know, Biocon does it. A lot of other pharma companies are also doing it, but it's the scale which makes a difference, and the and the pace of change, right? And exactly what Yash was saying is that look, today the 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 onus has shifted from uh, the professors and other people in an academia to people who are designing different platforms, building content, and then to both industry and academy on how that imparting the content is going to take place, right? So today, most of the training is becoming, you know, uh, through AI or through uh, web-based platforms, anytime, anywhere, and wherever we can introduce more and more of this virtual reality space, which is still quite nascent, as I understand it in pharma, it's going to make a huge difference for people even in, you know, their last few academic years to understand how an industry operates. Because today, being a regulated industry, pharma cannot allow people to come in and handle any documentation or touch any machine or go into a sterile space. 
but today uh, we have a virtual reality which is available and okay as we move ahead it will be more easily accessible so if that can come in then a lot of this talent can be nurtured and pulled up from the academia itself so i think there's a lot of good work being done but it is also true that right now the the gap is substantial and uh, we are hopeful that this gap will slowly start coming down right so over to you mr jain so thank you very much uh, both yes and amitabh uh, highlighted the very important point of skilling availability of skilling talent uh, and as yes was saying uh, in ipa although we have moved forward but uh, and amitabh was also highlighting but it is a major agenda and we have to go along right uh, as far as i am also the chair of life style skill council of india so i work with the government and yes is a member of the board there uh, we have just started but the more we get into it is we realize we have to do hell of a lot going forward uh, in fact uh, in the last meeting i couldn't attend but i am aware of the discussion we are working with pci so i will talk of two three different rules so one is industry specific rules like say manufacturing operation clinical trial medical some areas of medical marketing where you need industry knowledge experts with medical strong medical and pharmacology knowledge so what we are doing in this area long way to go still as we have also highlighted working with the academia to improve the courses with pharmacy council of india still the courses are not tuned to the change reality so yes you have to work on the courses and the second point with yes and amitabh is next yes you start with the course but the course requirement changes are so rapid so how do you first is getting skilling and getting industry ready talent where some amount of work is done by changing the courses and some amount of work which has been done by many of the industries companies starting the finishing schools right inducting the person on the manufacturing job the kind of machine like say uh, project lighthouse all of you must have heard sipla and dr reddy's plant has been declared as among top 100 manufacturing plant in the world which operates on robotics and digital information so the kind of skill which we will be requiring is a totally different green technology plant uh, smart plants now how so you need industry specific requirement so working with nipers working with pharmacology colleges working with engineering colleges pharmaceutical engineering is a very very important course what we are doing is can we work with the academic institution to develop the course that's point number 1 and developing your skill centers to build that center second is creating a continuous environment of learning in the organization it is a very very important thing and the courses of online courses become very very important in fact all of us must have read yesterday coursera uh, startup person was in india and he is talking about started digital analytic course by it metros if i remember rightly and all the iims are thinking of starting online courses so can we work with online educators and each company can work to upgrade their skills that will be a very very important dimension going forward but the two things which i will work both on what uh, yash is saying and imita is saying is skilling getting the right kind of skilling and we have just started long way to go in fact uh, yash has been right long way to go we are doing tinkering job at the moment but this is a major agenda work with academic institution but that alone is not enough working in the organization to upgrade the skills of the employees and identifying how the changes are taking place and preparing the employees ahead of time to build on those changes i will stop here great uh, thank you uh, sudarshan ji so you know i would like to just move the focus a little bit to specific areas of uh, functional areas right so the quality control function has been in the spotlight for indian pharma over the last decade uh, right uh, people have talked about since now we are talking about you know uh, you know uh, uh, skill shortages and uh, meeting that uh, through various programs and uh, uh, initiatives uh, has that been an area that uh, has been uh, largely addressed by pharmaceutical companies to meet uh, you know norms 
of uh, you know of the regulated markets when it comes to production manufacturing and quality control uh, yeah, sudarshan sudarshan ji maybe you can talk a little bit about how ipa is helping uh, in that or has that problem already been solved so uh, quality was one aspect another thing that seems to be recurring in these conversations is uh, you know technology is playing a very critical role uh, sudarshan did mention uh, robotics right as part of uh, uh this uh, joint initiative uh, project lighthouse will robotics also be the future in production and uh, you know uh, smart manufacturing um so these two topics uh, if we can take it uh, together and i'd like to hear uh, you know the thoughts from uh, the speakers on 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 these two uh, aspects uh you would like me to start uh, yes on sure. this please go ahead uh, to the uh, please, please. Uh, Sorry, sorry for this. Uh, this is such a bad topic, and this takes hell of a time of mine uh, because on one side we have got US FDA inspections, on the other side we have to work on overall upgrading the standards of quality. We have got ten thousand manufacturing plants, right? Uh, so this is the major agenda for IP because quality we have taken as a major task uh, for everyone. For last five years we have been working on this agenda. uh so if you see last 5 years we have got the many of the top companies leading companies have got the best quality talent globally to head the function because how do we learn ourselves the best global practices so you get the global talent because talent today is geography agnostic because we are a global of global industry we are not an indian industry first we have to recognize that pharma industry is a global industry and the talent has to be global level right so whatever the requirements which are there of supplying for us which we talk of icsh standards and in india we talk of schedule m standards there is a vast difference so the person who is heading the quality he has to understand and shift the mindset to a very different level so we are getting those talent uh, so head of the function for many of the organization we are trying to build on it but that alone is not enough because you have changed the act but unless you make the organization robust unless you build the quality and quality is not only quality person agenda quality has to be everyone's agenda so how do you bring about mindset of the organization to look at the quality how do you bring about the attitude overall indian attitude chalta hai to make sure that the things happen in a particular way and this is one of the price. so there is still issue there is a knowledge upgradation issue there is a digital skill set issue there is a mindset issue and there has to be an integrated approach to take it forward but number one priority for many of the companies when i started i thought marketing is the end all and be all of business organization but marketing if i i don't have plan which is approved by us fda you can have the best marketing talent but that is such a critical talent for the organization so getting the right kind of talent and building the world or all culture i will stop here and leave it to yash and amita to take it forward go ahead amita amita we are on uh, mute so in my view uh, quality is uh, not just quality it's a uh, like uh, mr jain said it's an attitude i think quality is a culture it's it's a cultural element in all of us uh, whichever industry we work in and pharma much higher than anyone else because we are we are in the business of saving lives i'll i'll give a simple example see uh, what we are trying to do now is we are trying to automate most of our plants right and most of the processes within those plants now if you are making plants which are dcs mes you know they are they are enabled and then you are also bringing in new concepts like electronic lab notebooks and so on and so forth the margin of error comes down significantly right so uh, what happens is that earlier and not getting into any specific company or any person or any department on a, a normal thing what used to happen is a guy was making an entry of 10 am when actually the guy would have started at 1002 but today the moment there is a electronic record getting created exactly. that error is showing up and to a regulator 
then it is a data integrity issue. It is not a data integrity issue actually. The guy did not mean to do any anything to fudge the data, but it's just a cultural concept in the mind of the person that to what extent the accuracy is supposed to be measured, right? So that's why we need this whole culture shift when it comes to quality and manufacturing. Culture takes a certain amount of time. It is not something that we can push a button or put two programs on the table and suddenly people will start behaving differently. And you know this, the, what what uh, uh, Mr. Jain said is chalta hai. The other word in India which is very common is jugad. Okay, this jugad and chalta hai cannot happen as we move more and more into automatic or, or robotics or digital environment, right? So I think we need to shift this population. The intent is there today. A lot of knowledge is coming in because most of the pharma companies are working very closely with consultants around the globe who have done it earlier or who have done it better. And there are a host of learning programs and also on the job trainings which are happening. So we will be moving to that, but this is the period where the learning curve is a little steep. And that's where we are feeling the heat. Right. Over to you, Yash. No, no, absolutely. It's it's very well said. I have very little to add. So, you know, one thing, Andre, you know, we all take pride in the pharma industry coming from India, all of us. And USFD also has said this to many companies that they've inspected. As as Amitav said. The, the issues are not around integrity. OK, so and, and that's good news, you know, so it's not like. Companies are low coach, but it's not that OK, but when you work in a highly regulated industry and there are some industries which are equally or more regulated than pharma, such as aerospace, OK, uh, automotive, oil and gas, OK. Uh, as they were getting regulated 20, 30 years back ago, even they were at the same learning scale that pharma is today. OK, so it's quality is a mindset. Quality is an attitude and quality is a culture, you know, as so beautifully explained by Amitabh. I just added these three. It's there and the Indian pharma industry and the Indian pharma companies all. I have immense respect for even my comp competing companies, you know, such as Biocon or Cipla or DRN, all of them. I, I'm not naming all, but all of them I have respect. They all take this very, very seriously. And I'm sure Mr. Jain will be with me. We all take it very seriously. We are working very hard towards resolving it. There's such a stepped up effort in building mindsets, in building attitude, in changing behaviors. It is incredible. OK. I I, I, I remember I, I'll just give you an example of how the context is building on what Amitabh said. OK, you are very right. So, you know. Not sharing your passwords is. A common understood process world over. But. In India. Sometimes we have the same email account used by the entire family where everyone uses the same password, right? So at home it's acceptable. So when you go to a workplace, you can't do that. You can't share your passwords, you know, uh, because when you are logging in, it's you who's logging in. All right. It's not about trust. It's it's about a process. So process orientation is the fifth thing that I'll add to it, you know, apart from mindset, attitude, culture, behavioral uh, changes, I would say process process. Making sure that process is a process, OK? And and a lot of work is going into that. I'm confident. I'm confident this will pass a, a lot of that cultural mindset, everything it get built, but it's a journey. It can't be done overnight. It can't be achieved overnight, but the best part I like about the pharma industry of India and most of the companies that work in it, they take it very seriously. They're working very hard towards it without being defensive about it. Without challenging the auditors and all that, OK? We don't externalize things, we internalize them and we are on because we are dealing with human health. So as long as our purpose is clear, we take that seriously, we will we will get there where the global standards are. So it's a matter of time. 
how has jain sahab said you know our worries and what keeps up at nights is how can it be done overnight because everyone wanted it as of yesterday and we know it cannot be done even overnight and we know that it's going to take a few more uh, months or maybe even years to get to that level so we will get there andre and and that's the reality you know uh, uh, andre if it is right i can add to what yes and yes. amita was saying all of us should be proud of the fact that every third tablet in us is sold from india yeah every fourth pill in europe is sold from india the whole world depends on us for health and during covid times when many of us were working from home all these workers making sure that the products are available in a quality which is required by any country with different regulatory standards around the world india understands the regulatory requirement of the world we supply to over 200 countries and none of the supplies consistent supplies had any quality complaint right yes there are, we have got 600 plants so sometimes there will be issues that's part of the game as far as that thing is concerned we learn and one the important point you have said we are not defensive about it we learn we move forward and work in the interest of the patient that's the beauty of this industry we are conscious that patient is the center of everything what we do and the industry has come a long way there is significant involvement i have never seen the kind of involvement which is there in quality agenda by ipcus themselves uh, because in fact nilesh gupta who is the uh, md of lupin he heads the quality initiative of ipa and i have never seen that kind of commitment which shows whether it is talent whether it is processes where whether it is going forward it is a top priority area for pharma industry i'll stop here spoken with a lot of passion so darshan ji thanks thank you for that and i i i echo it i think it's not about uh, i think we learn from mistakes and move on and you know you raise some very good statistics about you know why we should be proud as an industry we are basically a pharmacy to the world and i think that shouldn't get forgotten uh, i want to move on to uh, disruptive skills that create a competitive advantage uh, specifically uh, r and d as a as a function uh, which we we just briefly talked about initially and also technology which has now come up quite a few times in different uh, aspects whether it's robotics or digital and so forth um, on r and d uh, i'd like to also link it to uh, what has just happened uh, so we, we can't uh, hear and can, hear you, can you hear me hello yeah, yeah. so there has been a lot of emphasis by the government on how does one incentivize properly uh, pharmaceutical companies to invest more um in uh, in r and d uh, i would like your quick thoughts in terms of you know whether a budget which i know is a short term perspective but has it is it delivered delivering for the medium term uh, is the government taking the right steps um I'd like to hear from you know the, the pharma executives themselves uh, on this how do you all uh, perceive this and are we moving in the right direction uh, uh jain sahab can i go first or yeah yeah sure sure yes yeah. so you know uh, andre let me tell you i have no doubt in my mind that scientific skills of our country are par excellence they are number 1 in the world in india or indians being abroad both okay so when it comes to skills in research and development or discovery we have it all okay indian pharma companies themselves have proved that they can also develop new chemical entities okay glenmark has done it lupin has done it biocon has done it okay and whether they are very big molecules or not doesn't matter but developing a new chemical entity we companies have done it in fact we have licensed them they are in development stages some of them have come to the market and and uh, so it's there but you see you have to understand the economies of scale for big pharma and r and d and both sudarshan ji and me have worked in big pharma okay why and, and the reason i want to make this point is because it becomes unfair comparison so to develop a new drug 
okay? Say for a Abbott or a J&J &J or anyone. It averages between four to six billion US dollars, okay? And most of these companies, when they develop a drug, the, the first, uh, the, 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 the molecule in phase one is not even developed by them. Many a times they buy it from Japanese companies and Israeli companies, and then they develop it. So drug discovery, capability wise exist in India, Japan, Israel. It's a known thing. OK, it's the drug development. It's a very expensive process. OK, and it's a very lengthy process. So say you get a patent for 14, 15 years, right? That's the period you lose six, seven years only in development. So the amount you get to realize your patent and to recover your cost, it leaves you with sometimes four years, sometimes just six years. That's the economics now. You see, when Indian pharma companies come of that size, OK, where they can. Raise funds or invest, say, four to six billion dollars in developing a drug and still taking the risk of it, not making it to the market without their financials getting affected. Let me tell you, there'll be no difference between Indian pharma and big pharma. OK, so you have to understand and then look at it in context. Uh, it's it's not that you know the that the big pharma in US or England or Germany or you know whatever you may have are more proficient or skilled in discovering and developing drugs. No, it's not. It's economies of scale. Okay, and somewhere we will get up now from generics. Our industry is moving into complex generics and into speciality. The next one is going to be new chemical entities. It may take some time and, and you have to allow that to happen as the Indian economy grows. We because we grow the Indian economy grows. So you see how this is all connected. So I wanted to give this pin uh, Sudarshan ji uh, on this debate rather than just the skills. So people understand the uh, the complexity and the magnitude uh, over to you Sudarshan ji and Amitav. So maybe Amitav you would like to say first or should I? I can add a few things and yeah, you can add and then maybe uh, one can build on what Amitav you you are saying. Yeah. So uh, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, bang on, uh, Yash. Uh, see the the point here is uh, we need to distinguish between uh, the big pharma and Indian pharma in terms of what we can bring to the market. So scale, number of uh, drugs, the amount of investment. There's no comparison. Now, one of the points, Andrew, you mentioned was disruption. Now, disruption can happen through price. Disruption can happen through uh, molecules which are like biosimilars. Uh, disruption can happen through complex molecules, complex generics, which Yash was referring to. So at this point in time, there are multiple areas in which the Indian pharma can disrupt. But are we actually targeting disruption? I'm not so sure right now as a, as a uh, you know, industry. We are trying to consolidate the industry. We are trying to strengthen the industry. We are trying to make inroads in areas or places where we have not gone before. And there's always a price advantage which Indian Pharma has enjoyed. And honestly, like Yash said, it's not a talent issue in terms of discovering drugs. It is purely an economies of scale. In fact, you have companies, you know, one of them is a group company of ours like Sinjin, which actually mm. is a CRO. So we have talent. The issue is scale and investment. So the disruption in my mind at this stage will probably come more through price, more through the network and the supply, and, and then over a period of time, it will come in more complex molecules. Over to you, Sudarshini. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for Yash and Amitabh to set the context. Uh, so at the moment, we are very strong in small molecules like metformin, anti-TB drugs, and let me also once again state the fact for everyone. India changed the world by supplying TB drugs by Lupin and HIV drugs by Cipla. The world, if I go to Africa and if I go to any part of the world, they will worship those companies to the kind of affordable medicine, $1 a day cost of HIV drug when it used to cost $12,000 a year. Similar kind of change is being brought in biosimilar space today. 
and major disruption in the U.S. market. And I'm just monitoring that, which is being done by Biocon with launch of insulins, and they are working on interchangeability of insulins. So by similar space, for everyone's information, we get $83 billion saving to U.S. market every year to NCs. Next big disruption in the space, both in European market, as well as US market is in Biosimilars. And some of the companies which are present, Amitabh represents the company, just represents those companies. Intas is playing a very important role. So similar will be the next area of disruption. Second area of disruption, and maybe I will talk also the budget, uh, two thirds of the global pharma space is in innovation. One third is in a small molecule. Innovation also includes biosimilars and complex. Now we realize, all of us realize that we have to move up the value chain. It will take time. This budget has announced that the government will announce R&D funding through Centers for Excellence, right? It is a very positive move. We will see lot happening in this particular area. Four areas for focus on innovation, regulatory reforms, lot will be done. Like say in India, if you want to start research, you have to take permission from the government. That's the kind. So we are working on regulatory changes. We are working and that's why regulatory talent becomes very, very important to play a role instead of only quality control. How do you get expedite the approval? Who could have imagined that the vaccine can be developed in a year's time? So the whole model of development and AI will change as far as research discovery is concerned. Second is industry academic collaboration. Uh, and that's why government has also announced collaboration with ICMR, Centers for Excellence. That is the second area. Third is funding. Now, no research in the world can take place only through pharma. Own efforts. Government supports it. And fourth is creating centers of clusters for innovation. Like we have got Boston, we have got San Francisco, we have got Singapore. So can we create clusters where you have got medical colleges, you have got companies, you have got... Uh, Management Institute, uh, you have got clinical centers. So that is the work and that is one of the priority areas. So if I want to define the priority of the industry is quality and innovation. These are two major priorities. And a lot of work is being done. A lot of talent will be required. Like see, we are very strong in chemistry talent today. We will need biology talent, right? We will need global skills of conducting clinical trials. Right? So India, just to give another example, we do only 2% trials in the world, where 16% of the world population is here. So how do we make India as a hub of clinical trials? You would require different kind of talent, different kind of skills. So it is, again, a big opportunity area going forward. I stopped. Thank you for that. That call uh, very interesting insights. Um, in the interest of time, I had one more question as it related to technology. Maybe we can take it in the final, uh, you know, on the final topic. Um, so this is related to talent scouting. It's more around talent acquisition and talent scouting. Um, I'll move the focus a little bit more now to uh, slightly more general questions in this area. Uh, uh, one of the contemporary topics uh, today, uh, as it relates to uh, MNC pharma companies, um, operating in across the world and specifically in India there is a there are quite a few products now that will be going off patent uh, this has impacted uh, you know the uh, the prospects for pharma companies for the next three four years some of them you know have a have a more of a medium to long term plan 2026 2027 and onward but they need to survive for the next three four years with a lot of these products now going off patent what also happens is that there is a lot of talent that is available now, especially in sales and marketing, um, right? That uh, so our Indian companies and this question, uh, you know, would go out to the gentlemen who are CHROs as well as to Darshanji. Uh, are y'all is this talent that you know that uh, uh, y'all are looking to absorb, can absorb, want to absorb? Uh, will this talent maybe move to regional roles, you know, especially at the senior levels? Uh, uh, that is uh, one question. The other question is, uh, you know, you all have all worked in uh, multinational organizations at some point, uh, now working with Indian multinational organizations. Uh, is there still that cultural mindset of, you know, from moving from an, from an uh, MNC to an Indian company and everything that goes with that? Is there still, uh, you know, an inertia for many of the professionals out there? So two questions. Uh, I'll open the floor to, to you all to take it forward. Yes. Why don't you lead the way, Amitabh, this time? 
happy to do that. Mm, so your first question, if I understood it correctly, is that uh, there is an availability of talent, uh, but uh, you know, from our sourcing strategy or how we actually employ that talent, uh, are, are we clear about it or are we going to do it? Particularly, you mentioned sales and marketing and things like that. So let me answer it in a slightly different way. We started off discussing talent shortage and we are talking of uh, talent all the way. So there are you know, uh, areas of talent. There are pools of talent which are available today and there are large areas which we need to develop. That's where we started our discussion. Now, bringing in AI, bringing in a whole lot of technology to sourcing is always a good idea. It was used by IT companies about 10, 15 years back. And obviously those tools have got perfected. But AI or any other uh, platform uh, will not create talent. They will help us in terms of distinguishing talent A from B or what we require in a more focused, in a faster manner. Yeah than actually you know actually saying that okay this is you know i can groom this talent faster or i can groom this talent later or something like that so the way i look at it is yes there's going to be a lot of roles which are opening up as indian companies expanding there will be opportunities for people to go in different parts uh, be it uh, geographically different parts or within the company different areas all of this will open up today. Most companies have got career paths which are distinguished between individual career paths and managerial career paths. Uh, people have already started moving into different geographies for large Indian pharma companies. Uh, I don't think that is a problem. The issue is more core, and that's where we started that look, uh, as we move, see, it's a very interesting uh, thing. If you, if you look at robotics, if you look at automation, uh, what's an ideal plant today? A plant which today is being run by 100 people can be run by maybe five people or six people and everything else will be done by a machine so or a set of machines. So which means the error will come down significantly. You know, I can get a better scale on profits and whatever X, Y, Z. But I don't think in the Indian context that is really going to work in the long term because India is also a country where we get a lot of qualified labor and very good labor. People who can use their brains, people who can do jobs which are sometimes very, very different and very, I would say, path breaking, right? So let me put it in two parts. One, yes, the war for talent or the availability of talent is going to be an issue, but the talent that is available will get better opportunities. So that goes without saying, and that will obviously uh, encourage more and more people to learn faster and come up the curve. Second, Technology is absolutely essential, but all pharma companies and other companies also, other industries also will have to do a balancing act between whether we should go completely automated or we go automated to a very large extent and also uh, bring in talent to run those automated processes so that we can make a difference to pharma uh, where the other companies or the global companies today are not being able to do it. And one of them is, of course, cost. Two is reach. Third is quality. Right? Not in that order. So I'll stop here. Yash, Mr. Jain, please. Yes, you will take it over. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, very well said, Amitabh. Totally with you. Uh, not even want to add anything to what you have said. It's it's very comprehensive answer. But but if I may uh, add some of my own comments to this, Andre, to your question, you see. You have to understand the way the technology has evolved. Okay, so there are core technologies, and then there are application-based technologies. Okay, so core technologies are like what computing is a core technology. Wi-Fi is a core technology. Okay, but a networking application like a Facebook or a LinkedIn is an application-based software technology, right? And the reason I've taken these names are because they've all been very successful technologies with very high adoption rates, right? Now, if you were to talk about recruiting and what are the kind of technologies which will get used in recruiting? Well, let me tell you, we are not even office, okay? Because when it comes to <laughs> recruiting and use of technologies by companies, it's not because, you know, you know the recruitment process as much as we know, Andre, and we can claim to be experts in that. So 
it's it's not about just sourcing and identifying candidates or assessing them or onboarding them or making them successful and productive. It's not just that chain. OK, just imagine the amount of technological developments that are required for everything. OK, now with AI coming in. Assessments are likely to get, but again, there are serious questions around biases, right? Serious questions around biases. But the reason I see hope for technology and why it has to become like a core technology platform, OK? Or a serious application based platform, say for recruiting, will succeed is when. You are able to be highly productive, so say for example. One recruiter. Or one business leader can only interview, say four people in a day. If technology can do that and do thousand people in an hour. That that is where the scope is. OK, hmm. but for that to evolve significant investment needs to go in and I and I'm very sorry to say, but the technology companies are not investing significant amount of money in recruitment. A lot is going into ed tech, a lot is going into learning. A lot is going into marketing. A lot is going into networking. But the amount of money going into developing technologies around recruitment. Minimal. Minimal. And that's what the fear is. And and it happens, you know, unless there is a huge scope for it, it will be OK. So Sudarshan ji. So one is uh, thank you very much Amitabh and yes mentioned it only one point which I want to add. Uh, India is changing. India healthcare structure is still changing just to give some statistics. <laughs> we have got we used to add around 30,000 doctors every year. Now we are adding 100,000 doctors every year. Uh, we have started 150,000 wellness centers around the world, around the country. Now. Everyone says global market that manpower sales force manpower has to be contained. We have to go only for digital. In Indian market, still I feel that there is a need for physical manpower to go and meet the doctor. Right? There is no substitute at this. So digitalization for the sake of digitalization, unless it is backed with business strategy, will not pave the way for the organization. So one single message is Indian market is different. The level of development is different. It is a growth market. It is not a static market. How do you work on digitalization? How do you work on your manpower strategy? How do you work on your skilling strategy? It's very, very important, right? So there is an opportunity on innovation side. There is an opportunity on quality and that agenda. There is an opportunity to reach global markets. We supply still majorly to US and Europe. There are opportunities in other markets and there is opportunity to reach improve reach in the Indian market itself because healthcare, pharma, large companies market is concentrated only with 100,000 doctors. How do you get the reach and some of the new models which are emerging to get the reach and into phase four outcomes? I will stop. Yeah. Great. Um, on that note, uh, so Yash, I'd like, you know, you had shared with me a few points. Some of them I found I wanted to ask you. So I'll direct that question to you and extend it to Sudarshan Ji and Amitabh. Uh, you know, so you mentioned uh, I'll take three or four points. One is, uh, you know, movement transition from people analytics to talent intelligence. I think you sort of slightly addressed that in your earlier comments. So that was one people analytics to talent intelligence focus on people sustainability versus employee experience. This is for employees in the organization. So maybe you could just touch on what you mean by that. And the third is uh, you said, of course, the role of the recruiter is going to be increasingly important. Uh, you did also mention recruiters and you know, uh, how do we increase productivity there? Maybe you can touch on these. Uh, I'll open the floor to you on these three points. And you know, if you want to talk about some of the other points that you mentioned as it relates to uh, talent and talent trends. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you know, um, uh, let me let me answer each one. So. You see the biggest opportunity I say for people analytics, why is? Because the data base is being 
created on people analytics are now reaching the big data levels. OK, so if you look at how the technology systems are designed, enterprise wide technology systems or platforms are designed for organizations, their system of records. OK, so there's a system of records for customers. There's a system of records for all financial documents and dealings. There's a system of record for, you know, uh, employees and everything that happens around it, whatever their system of records. Majority of the organizations have been on enterprise wide system of records for employees now. OK, where payroll is automated and digitized where and for not just one decade, for almost two decades. People analytics is not necessarily only related or limited to your organization. You can get a lot of people analytics from subgroup datas. OK. But how do we go about doing it? And this is uh, this is an initiative, you know, which is being discussed by the tech companies and by the CHRO forums on how to do this, but uh, not just in India, but even uh, at an external level outside. And uh, and there are various uh, initiatives which have come about, you know, which have come out like call tricks from SAP, etc. So I, I truly believe that that's the next big step and a low hanging fruit that needs to be picked up. A lot of us today, and I hate to say this, uh, but I say it with my humility, but uh, a lot of us today in HR don't even understand what people analytics is all about. Is analytics for, uh, you know, just reporting or, or is it for doing some predictive analysis or decision making? We don't understand because majority of the people don't understand they're not progressing the agenda. OK, so that's what my that was what part was. Uh, the thing on employee experience, let me tell you. Uh, employee experience has been extremely crucial throughout. Throughout. I mean, the recent tech layoffs that have happened, okay, by Google, by Facebook, by Amazon, by all of them. And if you see the memes which are coming, okay, everyone is saying, you know, we don't want a fancy joining kit and free coffee and seven. What we want is meaningful work and a job. So employee experience at core needs to be understand and defined. Just making people wear red caps and on 25th of uh, December and making them jump up and down and dance and cut a cake. Is not, you know, uh, fun at workplace or is not employee experience, giving them a fancy joining kit with a water bottle and all that so that they can click a picture and post it is not employee. These are very small parts of them. The biggest part of an employee experience is all about meaningful work. Fairness at a workplace, fair rewards. And. Most important is assurance. Assurance and safety related to job, health and mental well-being. So employee experience has been redefined. By the employees themselves. And the organizations and the the HR communities, so again to say, uh, are still focusing on the joining kit and you know all that. It's okay. That's important. You can do it. The third that I want to add, and maybe Sudarshan ji and Amitabh would love to hear your views on this. I'll tell you, and this is something that keeps me up at nights. You see, this entire latest thing of uh, workforce flexibility and work from home, which started during the pandemic and has become a huge employee need. OK. It has to be dealt with very carefully, OK? Because let me tell you. Organizations that totally worked from home were these tech organizations which laid off people. Organizations like Pharma, we had minimal work from home because of the law we had to keep our factories, our research labs and development uh, facilities and our sales force on the ground. OK. But and this is my personal opinion and view. I am seeing and nobody wants to call it out at the risk of being seen as, you know, uh, not progressive. But let me tell you this entire thing around too much of work flexibility and too much of work from home is costing productivity. As it is, India lags in productivity. It is. Tell me one thing, Andre. If 
someone wants to work for an organization and says that I want to 100% work from home, okay? Then I might as well as subcontract or outsource that job to an agency, you know, like personal search services. You also provide, right? Contract employees to us. There is a reason why we want, if not all the time, at least for some time to come. So somewhere this mindset, you know, so because talent has won the war, so talent is dictating, but it is hurting the industry. It is hurting the industry. Somewhere we will have to, you see, if we want work, if we want rewards, if we want everyone to take care of our well-being and health, then kaam to karna padega na yaar. And what is that kaam karna padega is, let me tell you one of the biggest thing that keeps me up at nights is, India, we have the smartest people, we have the most skilled people, everything we talk about and we take tremendous pride because I'm a total Indian, you know, in my heart, head and soul. But we lack in productivity. It's a fact. I have lived and worked. I have seen the, the French work only four and a half days a week, but they're so productive because they're so organized. They're so scheduled. You can't even go for meeting someone in a government office without an appointment. Nothing works without an appointment. And that culture has brought in so much of efficiency because you know you can't miss that appointment. If you miss that appointment, you will not be able to meet that person. But here, if I want to go and meet Mr. Sudarshan Jain and if I tell him that, sir, I'll meet you at 10 o'clock, our national character is that I don't know if I take that 10 o'clock very seriously. With Mr. Jain, I will take it seriously because of his stature. But say, if we were to say someone else, and I'll say, yaar, das it's okay, I'm my meeting is over running. I'll meet him at 10.30. This is not productive behavior. So a lot of these fundamental things have to change. If they don't change fast, we'll have the best technology, we'll have the best skills, we'll have the best intentions. We will not be a very productive nation. And an industry. You know, nation is too large for me to talk about, but industry. So, so these are thorny issues. They have to be handled. They have to be dealt with. They have to be confronted. And people should speak their mind out the way I'm speaking, you know. So with that, I hand over to Sudarshan ji, you know. <laughs> Wait, let Amitav speak and then uh, I, uh, maybe uh, I, I'll be just very, very short. I totally echo, yes, your views. Although I am maybe old minds, old, uh, I have been at this particular age, but uh, I believe uh, work from office, work at office, human interaction has got a lot of value and the productivity context changes fundamentally. I'll stop here, go to your Totally echo your no, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, I want to add anything to that particular point because we have seen in the results. And like Yash said, uh, you know, what has won actually over a period of three to four years is stability, having a purpose for coming to work or doing the work. And most important, that assurance that, you know, I, as an employee is taken care of. Right. And that we have won and we will continue to win in this industry because there's no other industry which can challenge the purpose of work than pharma. The only other thing where I wanted to do a little more addition to what Yash said is the first point where we are talking of analytics. And it is so true, like most of us in HR, uh, you know, till some time back, most of our analytics were around, let's say, attrition, gender, you know, rating or performance of people who were either retained or who are trited and so on. This is so passive. It, 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 it doesn't work anymore. What really works is, like I said, predictive analytics. What can you, you know, predict from the data that you're seeing in terms of what is going to happen? Then, you know, in terms of what kind of people are we losing or are we retaining? Are they the real talent? It is not about ratings. It is not about how much sale a person has made because there could be multiple reasons for that person doing low or high. Is the talent real? Is that talent what I look at as a succession planning going forward, even at a mid to senior levels, not at a very senior level? There it's obvious. Those are things which we need to now look at and that predictability will take us a long way 
from where we are today. And exactly the point, it's not about, you know, the 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 short term experience. It's about the long term experience. It is the long term sustainability consistency, which this industry has always proven that makes a difference. So that's why in pharma companies, you'll see people working for eight years, 10 years, 12 years, 20 years. It's not because they, you know, didn't get a job. Of course, they got a job. There are a lot of people who got higher jobs, higher paid jobs. But many of those people wanted to stay back because they knew that they were adding value. And the company in turn was also taking care of them, right? So I think in many ways, the last two, three years have shown us that we are on the right path. The only thing that we need to do is to focus, focus, and focus, and then deliver. That's my part. Great. Uh, we'll open the floor up to questions from the audience. Uh, you can type your question in the chat, uh, and we'll, take, we'll try and take them one by one. Please go ahead. So there is one question that is coming from Julian D'Souza. What is HR doing to upgrade the skills of their existing talent? Uh, this is already, we've, we've touched on this already. Is there anything else that uh, you gentlemen would like to add to that? What is HR doing to upgrade the skills of existing talent? Maybe we've not already talked about. I'll, I'll take that. You know, at least to start with, see, if you look at the development of talent or upgrading the skill uh, of the talent that we have in our companies, it is in multiple ways. One of the most important ways is obviously, you know, giving training today more as a mix of online and classroom. Uh, and that hybrid model today is getting more and more acceptable because people can do things outside their shop floor time, which otherwise was getting a little bit tight but it needs to be monitored right so that people don't misuse it. There's no, uh, in my mind, there is no uh, comparison to one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face training, but there are certain merits of online training as well. So, you know, obviously there are certification pathways. Uh, people are identified early in terms of which path do they want to take. There are choices given to employees in terms of whether they want to uh, create a career path in one domain or move across one or two different domains. Then once the initial skill training is done and the skill training is done in various different ways in different companies, the next one is creating leaders. So there's a lot of behavioral training which comes in. It comes in the form of uh, higher education through uh, cross-functional projects and through master classes and similar programs. And then as a person grows a little higher, then comes in coaching, then comes in a lot of mentoring service for these people. So there are multiple avenues which HR is taking to groom the talent. The question is how focused are we and how quickly are we adapting to what is the need of the hour, both as organization and employees. So that's where the, the actual need is today. Okay. This there's another question here as it relates a little bit more to policy. Is there anything the government can do to encourage pharmaceutical research uh, on a smaller scale? Um, so outside of you know Indian big pharma, individual scientists and the like. Uh, also you know uh, is PP funding you know some of the other policy issues like tax tax benefits um, encouraging this. So again this we we touched on this topic a little bit when we were talking about R and D. Uh, this is a little bit more you know small scale uh, research is that something that's an opportunity or is or not uh, like i can add here uh, one is uh, there's an organization PIRAC, uh, which has been set by the government and uh, PIRAC is doing an excellent work and amitabh will be aware of it uh, the kind of work which they have done in the med tech devices space uh, if you see during the early part of the COVID, we used to import Every we used to import masks, we used to import diagnostic tests, we used to import ventilators. But the kind of new new entrepreneurs which have come in is phenomenal, and Bragg is playing a very very important role. I will say it is great to hear and read about the work of Bragg. They have been promoting a lot of startups in healthcare, and a lot of new incubators are starting in healthcare because healthcare will be one very promising area of startups, particularly in med tech space, diagnostic space, 
uh, yes, big time pharma research is a very different kind of thing which costs money. But other areas I see a lot of innovation happening and PIRAC and other organizations, private equity also supporting, venture funds are supporting those kind of areas. Good. Um, okay, we have a few questions coming in now. Try and take them one by one here. Um, does the pharma industry feel the need for skill sets to forge digital partnerships between uh, between pharma and tech businesses for clinical trials, AIML, blockchain tech, personalized medicine, etc.? How much do you outsource? How much um, do you have? Uh, you know where you can have your own talent. So the, if I just try and uh, paraphrase that uh, yeah so I think the confluence between technology and pharma uh, I think that's where the question is going and maybe application of the disruptive tech uh, you know that we're seeing in the pharma space we've touched on this as well not too much but yeah anyone would like to take that question no let me give it an attempt so um, of course, you know, uh, not all, but most pharma companies are also getting into digital services, solutions, and digital products business. Okay. Because they have realized that's also a way forward. So, as they are building these businesses, and you know, in, in a digital business, alliances is a key role. Okay. And alliances is a key strategy because you can't develop and do everything yourself. At the same time, there are uh, pharma specific blockchain organizations which have taken birth OK, few years ago. And when they come of age, they'll be the alliance partners. There are so many healthcare app developers, not of devices and instruments alone, but on on just service platforms itself. So a lot of alliances have happened there. Same goes in drug development discovery. OK, same goes in research and development and especially uh, CDMO and CRO organizations are just way, way ahead. And Amitabh can comment about that. You know, they don't develop everything themselves. Uh, everything is based on alliances there. OK, and uh, lastly, when you come to Salesforce effectiveness, oh, there's a huge collaboration and alliances with platforms or platform builders. Now, every company has got a uh, you know AI chatbot or a AI robot, you know helping their customers, helping their salespeople, including sales training and effectiveness. And uh, though they are proprietary, so there are uh, partners, you know, organizations which help you develop them, like e-prescriptions, etc. And and there are a lot of alliances that are happening with pharmacies. Okay, so like say whether it is. Uh, Geomart or whether it is farm easy. I mean, they have totally gone into uh, e-pharmacies and they have been tying up for a supply which is uh, direct to uh, uh, direct from factory to the digital supplier, of course, with the still prescription and everything. So answer is yes, and it's not only happened, it's happening. And uh, answer is yes, 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 absolutely. A uh, follow up to that, uh, you know, uh, what about uh, patient data uh, at a, you know, at a government level? Uh, and there is privacy issues around this, you know, in the US, you've got HIPAA and, and so forth. But is the Indian government or, you know, is the industry, are the industry bodies, uh, you know, using, you know, the benefits that or the promise that blockchain can provide to, you know, to hold patient data and that that can be useful to government policy making. It can be useful to pharma companies promoting products. It's useful to patients you know, to have access to the best medicines or, you know, uh, expertise of doctors. Just, uh, you know, that was a thought that I had in my head. Uh, Sudarshan ji, maybe you could uh, talk about this if there is any uh, initiative on this front. Uh, so uh, a very interesting question. In the, uh, uh, like say India has taken a lead in Aadhaar card and UPI payment system in this country. Next big revolution is healthcare records. There are 21 crore patients whose data has been stored and healthcare records, like say each one of us, 
we have got our files which are outdated when we go from one hospital to another. Again, the tests are done. So government is creating digi lockers where healthcare data will be stored. We are also creating national registry of doctors and services, right? So healthcare record is going to be one big area. We are trying to figure out the privacy challenges at the moment, which is slightly inhibiting at this particular moment. But I think that will be a very great movement forward and it will lead improvement in the efficiency of healthcare services and also analytics going forward. And I thank you very much for this interesting question. It has been mentioned in the budget this time, and Dr. Arish Sharma, who created Aadhaar Card, he, this is a passionate project. Uh, so we are trying to find it out how we have to ask this. Thank you very much. Wonderful. That's that's great to hear. I think it has benefits. You know, if one can address privacy concerns of individuals, uh, which I, I think in India we tend to be a little bit more lean on that. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think there are so many benefits for all the stakeholders. Um, okay, so we thanks for that, Sudarshan ji. We'll just uh, get back to the questions here. There's one question on behavioral training and coaching. So I did notice again on you know the websites, uh, Lupin, Biocon, uh, Cipla, Glenmark, and many others where you know while we talk about uh, technical training, uh, you know on tech, on uh, on roles that require a specific level of uh, professional expertise, but you do mention a, a lot. There is a lot of focus given to management. Uh, skill development, uh, you know, uh, and of course, uh, you know, leadership and so forth. Uh, I would like to hear from uh, Yash and Amita on on this. Uh, how, you know, sometimes this is seen as a little bit of a soft topic, but it seems like it's very critical to, uh, you know, running uh, the pharmaceutical business, right? A blend of both people skills as well as technical knowledge and expertise. Can you all comment on that? And you know, from a insider's perspective, how how important is that? and the lack of that, how does it impact business? Okay, um, so I'll take uh, the first. Um, so so it goes back to what I was saying that, look, uh, there are different kinds of training which needs to be imparted at different uh, part of a employee life cycle. Okay, that's number one. Number two is uh, if you go back to our discussion on automation and robotics, uh, yes, it's very important to bring in automation. It's also important to bring in robotics. But in a country like India, it's my personal view that it is not the ideal approach to make completely automated plants where people will not have a role to play. Uh, I, I don't think that's the way uh, we are going to go, at least in the near to midterm. Uh, long term could be very different depending on a lot of other factors. Now, as you look at each stage of modernization and, and uh, you know, changes that come in, what is going to be very important is how people face that change and adapt to that change. And that's where our behavioral competencies come in. That's where the culture of the company comes in. And that's where the leadership values come in. So there's no substitute for behavioral competencies or behavioral training if we are saying that we need to build more technology savvy plants or more technology savvy units. So both have to go hand in hand sure. together. Yeah, I have, I have nothing to add to what Amitabh has said. It, it's perfect. I have really perfect. nothing to add. We can move to the next question. Good. Uh, this is an, there's another question here on. Uh, so how are you measuring effectiveness of talent initiatives like mentoring? Uh, building digital skills and shifting the mindset and culture. Uh, so again, a fairly open-ended question. Um, and anyone can take that. I mean, uh, I can take that very quickly and tell that, look, uh, there are various uh, measures that companies uh, deploy in, uh, in measuring the effectiveness of any effort that goes in, okay? Uh, whether it is marketing, promotional expenses, training, learning expenses, everything. OK, I think off late what I've seen, one of the best measures uh, that has stood the test of time and has become universally ac accepted is the net promoter score methodology. OK, NPS, because that's one foolproof method of saying who are the, your net promoters and who are your detractors, right? That's what defines if an organization 
project's efforts, whether internal or external, are working or not working. So, so that's the one to it. I mean, that's a, a very short and a simple answer to this. Only one point, uh, yes, I would like to add is we want to talk of diversity of talent and women joining the workforce and what we need to do, and also taking disadvantaged people in the organization. Because that becomes very, very important. I will stop here. Yeah. Yes, so that's a good yes. question. And uh, sorry, go ahead. Yes. I, I mean, diversity and inclusion, okay? Uh, because, you know, uh, inclusion is an attitude, is an uh, behavior which leads to building diversity in your organization, as Jain Saab said. I think uh, we have to go a long way as a country. And when it comes to diversity, gender diversity is a big issue. Therefore, we are focusing on it. But it should be ethnic, educational, all, all kinds of diversity that has to be there. And that's what makes us, a in, if, if a organization is inclusive, if a society is inclusive, if a city is inclusive, then a nation is inclusive, right? It, it, it is ground up. So organizations play a huge role in demonstrating role modeling and institutionalizing that thinking and behavior. OK, uh, very well said, uh, Mr. Jain. And uh, because of ESG, the, the efforts I can see are picking up. But otherwise, you know, the efforts were uh, mostly lip service. <laughs> On the uh, on the point of differently abled people, um, right? And it does, you know, some I, I guess people on the autism spectrum also fall into this category. Some of the most intelligent people, in terms of IQ, um, do your organizations have a? I wouldn't say a, a mandate, but uh, is this something you all are cognizant of uh, uh, for specific uh, functions or specific roles? Um, you know, and that could be, you know, technology, uh, you know, so when it comes to disabilities, it could be mental, it could also be physical. So physical is, uh, you know, something uh, that's also uh, considered disability. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, is there a mandate by pharmaceutical companies and or organizations in general towards, you know, uh, including, you know, these individuals uh, for very specific roles? Do you all have programs for it? Um, would like, like to hear from you all on this. So, I'll, so yeah, I'll I mean, Sorry, Amitabh, yes, please go ahead. Amitabh, okay. go ahead. No, no, go see, ahead. Go uh, ahead. no, no, absolutely. Andre, that's a good question. Now, what happens is pharma is limited because you see, pharma is the only sector because of very high regulation. Okay. The way we manufacture, the way we produced FDA, US FDA, Indian FDA, all. There have to be certain fitness levels of people, including your health, right? So, say if you are suffering from an infectious disease, you cannot go and work on the shop floor or in the lab because you will transmit it. Hence, pharma world over is the industry in which fitness tests, etc., are very much required. So, so what happens is this regulation and this requirement itself goes against the will to bring in people with, you know, different abilities, right? Um, so say, for example, uh, you want to hire people with uh, visual disability. Now you can you can't hire them in manufacturing quality or you know this thing because you need a full fitness profile. But you can definitely hire them as receptionists. As uh, you can hire them uh, also as uh, sales uh, people. Nothing stops us, and we do it. Okay. Um, so you know. I feel bad in saying this uh, because, you know, because of the legal and uh, regulatory requirements, which are right in its place, we really get limited to show that. But the amount of effort that has gone in, in the Indian Pharma to make all the facilities accessible to people with all kind of abilities is huge, is beautiful. I really take pride in that so that we are making them ready because, you know, the work has to start from there. So if someone is wheelchair bound can work in quality. Doesn't stop you. But you need to have a building where the person can move through the wheelchair from a cafeteria to the fourth floor, to the third floor, to the reception, to the car park. Right? So all that work has happened, which is beautiful. And a, a lot of this is getting reported. And you'll see the, the ESG scores of Indian pharma companies, 
even for the first time, second time or third time that they have gone now, are one of the highest. It's it's amazing. So you see, uh, pharma is uh, usually a very inclusive, but uh, but it still lacks in gender diversity, as uh, uh, you know, uh, Jain Saab said. And it is working very hard on improving that. Very hard on improving on that. Sure. Thanks, Yash. Thanks for that question. Uh, there was another question from. Uh, so this was again just going back to talent scouting and uh, you know so. What and this is again more geared towards Yash and Amitabha. Uh, you know what are uh, large pharma companies today looking for in uh, uh, an executive search firm or a consulting firm in terms of the value add and value proposition? Today information is available, so it's not just about scouting. Um, so I'll open that question up. It's a question that it's close to home. Sudarshan ji, also you can you know if there's something you want to add on that, love to hear from you all. I thought, Henry, uh, you will answer that question because it's closer to your heart than any one of us. Uh, I'll just go first. Uh, two things uh, top of mind. Of course, there are many more. Uh, in my mind uh, today, the world is a much smaller and a well networked place. And you know, today is better than yesterday. So the executive search firms can bring in a lot of people from different geographies and you know, different areas uh, quickly to the table. Uh, than they were able to do in the past. So any company, if I as Biocon, I'm going to hire some senior folks, I would like to see the go talent pool and see how quickly we can reach out to them. So that's number one. Number two, I think still uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, exec search firms are operating in the old method of, uh, you know, going through step one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Uh, I have personally not seen too much use of technology. OK, maybe I've missed something, but uh, you know, my personal uh, view is that uh, the exit search firms should use uh, different kinds of technology to screen out people, not necessarily as yes or no, but in different pockets. So today when we are getting a docket of a senior person, it's very standardized and I'm not getting a slightly different kind of a docket looking at how this person would be more than, uh, you know, just the the experience part in that area. You know, I, I, I let's say I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say I want to hire a senior quality person and I'm trying to get a global quality pool evaluated for that position. Uh, the, the docket that I get for each person still says this is the experience. These are some of the milestones the person has achieved. I think that's very old school. I think we should now look at, you know, uh, how this person can transform the business that I am in uh, being a part of that report. And you can use various tools to do that. And, uh, you know, when many of these uh, senior positions are, uh, you know, they're coming out or they're put in the market, there's a lot of effort that goes from both the partners, the company as well as the search firm. So we can very quickly oh. stitch together those kind of uh, areas which will actually give value to an interviewer or to a person who's shortlisted. So one, the reach, Two is technology. I think we can do a lot more. Yeah, very well said, Amitabh. So, Andre, my take on this is for a CEO and a CHRO like me or for an organization, you engage executive search for executive hiring. Okay, that's very clear. And what do you measure the success on? Three factors. I've always measured the recruitment success at any level of my own recruitment team or another executive search firm on three things, speed, quality, and cost. Okay, and that will never change. So speed is where I think Amitabh made that point. I totally agree with him. Executive search firms are not using technology. They, you know, you talk to all of them, they still give you those stand. You see, after you sign the mandate with us, we will take four weeks for the shortlist. Then we will take an... Seriously? With so much of technology available, I'm telling you disruption is going to happen where they're going to arise one executive search firm, which will say, before you sign the mandate with us, we will give you the shortlist. Basis that you decide whether you want to give us the mandate or not. Okay? 
or maybe two days after you sign the mandate, whichever. I'm telling you that. So use of technology again when you come to quality. OK, so quality of candidates. Uh, I'm not talking about the quality of the end higher result. OK, that of course an executive search firm should take greater responsibility for that. It's there, but say quality of reports on the executive candidates. When I see from the search firms. You know, and I don't want to name or shame anyone. You know, it's not don't take me in the right spirit since this is uh, the question that you have asked. The reports on candidates are cut and paste jobs. From LinkedIn, from their CVs. They're probably one benchmark in the world, including India is Egon Zender. You read a Egon Zender report on a candidate and you'll feel the candidate is sitting in front of you. And they use technology to do that. Senior partners write it themselves. They don't delegate it to someone junior who writes it and then just emails it. Executive search firm sends you candidate reports which are in different formats. Because they cut and paste jobs. Again, here it's not just technology. It is also the seriousness by the senior person who is doing that role. OK, that is quality which needs to happen. Otherwise, someone is going to come and disrupt it. OK, uh, but the model and the benchmark there is Egon Zender. Absolutely top notch candidate report and any CEO that I've worked with in India or outside has always said and they have stuck to Egon Zender just because of the experience on the candidate reports and the way they meet. OK. The third on the cost, OK, that also has to change. You see, of, often the justification is yes, because we are a service company. We already start rendering service. We don't know whether we'll be successful or not. So we want to have 35, 30 percent, you know, or 25, 25, four times or 33, 33, three times standard. OK, at best, all firms have now started saying pay us the last 33 percent only if the candidate is successful and that has only changed since the pandemic. But all firms globally that I have a contract with for Lupin, they guarantee that they say that last part of the fees is only when the can. So they're putting the skin in the game, which is good. But you see gone is that luxury. Because no. Industry world only in India, say a real estate where a builder keeps taking money and keeps building your house or a search company keeps taking money and finds your candidate. Everywhere else, the service, the product or a solution provider gets paid only after final delivery. So why is the search industry not going down that way? Again, a disruption will happen where one big player will change it and everyone will follow suit. So, so you ask a CHRO like me or you ask any CEO, and if they speak their mind like I do, they will tell you these are the three things. And let's ask the CEO now, Sudarshan Jain. <laughs> Jain sir. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, yes, uh, you have told it. So I will stop here. Now, Amita, you want to add because your views are. No, I think I think I added whatever uh, I had to say, and I think we are completely aligned. And Thank I think uh, Andrew, you you are in the game yourself, so you know you know what needs to be done. Sure. I wanted to check uh, I did time wise how much time uh, more. Than I, we yeah, we've just about wrapped up. I think it's uh, sort of uh, has worked out pretty well. Uh, I don't believe there are any more questions and we're also out of time. So I'll use this as an opportunity to uh, thank uh, all of you all. Um, so Darshanji, Yash, Amitav, thank you so much for your time. It's a Friday evening, so I'm sure you all want to you know, get back and uh, you know, start the weekend and uh, but I thank you so much for spending almost a couple of hours here with us um, and really appreciate the insights. Uh, I also want to thank the audience who joined us uh, for the event today. Uh, Mario is also on the call, so I'm, you want to say something before we close? Thanks, thanks, Yash, thanks Amita for uh, this very insightful session. And thank you for uh, supporting us in, uh, I think, this important initiative initiated by Andre. Thanks and thanks a lot. Have a great weekend. Oh, no, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mario and Andre, for having us. Like Jen Sub said, you know, uh, it, it's always a privilege. You know, I've, I have the greatest respect for you, Mario, and the firm that you have built. Uh, it's phenomenal. And uh, thank you for the inv invite. I hope people appreciate and like what we just said.
Yeah. And thank you very much, Mario, and thank you, NK, and thank you to Yash, Amitabh, and uh, very insightful discussion, and all the participants who are there till now listening to us. Thank you for the push. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.